Good morning, church. It's good to be with you, to see you all. Hey, to everybody watching online as well, thank you for joining us as we worship together. My name is Evan. I'm the teaching pastor. If I don't know you yet, I would love to know you. I know there are a lot of folks coming in this morning that I haven't met yet, and that is awesome. Thank you for being here. We're in the midst of this series called The God Jesus Prayed To. You know, you can learn a lot about what somebody thinks about God based on hearing how they pray. So this series, we've been examining some prayers of Jesus, because like nobody knows God better than Jesus to see what we can learn about the character of God. Some of these things that emerge have shown us a lot about God, and it's good that we discover deep truths about God. But, But I also pray that this series would be encouraging that these things we find out about God might help us as we navigate our lives, might challenge us as well. The characteristic that emerges today is that God is generous. God is generous, a selfless generosity. That's all about God's character. As I was thinking about generosity this week and preparing for this message, I was trying to remember, like, man, what is the best gift I've ever gotten? something that I've gotten that I just think about and love. And there are a lot of potential answers there. Super Nintendos, for sure, are up pretty high. But really what it comes down to when I think about it, I think about a letter I got from my grandma. I know, you're supposed to say ah right there. I'll try it again. My grandma, I know. My grandma's awesome. I love my grandma. I grew up. Before I was nine, when I was nine, my mom and my stepdad got married. But before then, I was living in, uh, with my grandparents, my mom, and my aunts. And my mom worked all day, and my grandpa worked all day, and my aunts were in school. And so up until I was nine, I spent every day with my grandma. She wrote this letter and gave it to me a, a few years ago. I don't even remember what the occasion was. But as I read it, it was full of all these hopes and prayers that she had had for me, things that she had prayed for me and wished and things she was proud about. And she was honest about struggles too, how difficult it was to try to figure out how to raise your grandchild who is the son of your own child who is still a child herself. I love this letter. I keep it in a special place in my house. And not just because of the gift that it was in the moment, but because it was a celebration, a reminder of all the ways that my grandma had given of herself for me. Today, as we open up the scripture, we'll be in John chapter 17. This is a prayer that we get to overhear that Jesus is praying to God right before he goes to the cross. And what is astounding to me about this prayer as I was studying it this week is I was kind of looking for where is that word give or giving or giving that pops up in this passage. I started to circle the word give or giving. I might challenge you to do that yourself as you look at this text. And man, it is all over the place. Jesus in his darkest hour is praying and talking so much about God's generosity. It seems like God's generosity is so essential to his character. It is so deeply impacted how Jesus prays and thinks about God. And and there's a lot of things that he talks about God giving him and giving us in this prayer. Some of them we've talked about already in this series. For example, eternal life. That one of the things God gives is access to the God of the universe so that regardless of who we are or what we've done, We can turn to God and he can forgive us, welcome us to his family, make us new and give us new life now and forever. But where I want us to look this morning starts in John 17, verse 6. And I want us to notice some things that emerge about the generosity of God. Now, I'll admit, when we talk about generosity, maybe immediately we go to financial. And and I'll tell you, God has been generous with us financially too. A year ago, at the beginning of 2020, we we prayed that God perhaps would in 2020 help us develop hilarious generosity as a church. That's something we prayed, having no clue what 2020 would bring us. Well, God did that 
through you. We're going to tell you more about some of those things and celebrate them in the coming weeks, but, but 2020 was the highest amount given ever in the history of First Temple, and we didn't meet in person for five months. Like, isn't that ridiculous, hilarious? You gave more than $285,000 to mission work. Yeah, locally, across the state, across the globe. Get this, we partnered with another church and an organization that buys up medical debt that is in collection, and the collection folks are harassing folks for this debt. They buy that debt up for pennies on the dollar. We partnered with another church, and we bought up what amounted to $1.1 million in medical debt in Texas. Two-thirds of that was right here in Bell County, our neighbors, right? God has been generous for us. But I want us to see some other ways that God has been generous that aren't just financial. I think we'll see some things emerge here of how God has been generous with Jesus that then transfer as he is generous to us. So look with me at John 17, starting in verse 6. Jesus says, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now, they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given them to them. And they received them. And they know in truth that I came from you, for you have believed that you sent me. Right? They believed that you sent me. So two things jump out to me in these two verses about what God has given Jesus. The first thing we see are those whom you gave me, right? So the first thing we see is that God has given Jesus a people. We're going to talk more about that later. Another thing we see are these words that you have given me, Jesus says. You have given me these words, words. Jesus has been given words. Words are are, are a message. In the Bible, the word word has all kinds of depth of meaning. Jesus himself is called the Word, right? God's message for us, the revelation of who God is to us. When we see Jesus, we see God, the Word. Scripture, the Bible is called the Word of God, that we can look here and see what God has to say to us and about us and for us. We have been given a Word. Throughout uh, the scripture, this shows up in lots of places, but in Matthew 6, another one of the prayers that we're looking at in this series is the Lord's Prayer. It may be familiar to you. In Matthew 6, verse 11, Jesus says, pray like this, give us our, this day our daily bread. Right? You maybe know that part of the prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Bread here means literally like bread, like food, like what we need to survive, Now, maybe some of y'all in this room are like doing keto or something, and you need to replace it with like almonds or something. I don't understand, but I'm proud of you. Good job. He means like literally provide for us the things that we need. But bread has kind of a depth of meaning too. Like even in our culture, like when we talk about bread or like dough, can have some other meanings. Or like money or something like that. Like the things that give us sustenance, what what we need. In fact, When Jesus is talking about the things that he teaches throughout the New Testament, he'll say, my message is my bread, right? So so Jesus' words are bread. In this prayer in John 17, right before this prayer, he's met with his disciples. They shared a meal together. He took bread and he broke it. He said, this bread is a symbol of my body, broken for you. So bread means bread, and it means Jesus' message. It means Jesus' sacrifice, his words, and his actions give us this day our daily bread. I can't move on without mentioning that it says daily. In the original Greek, that word daily means daily. (laughs) For us in our culture, man, that's not usually how we operate. Like, I have a Sam's Club membership. I've still got some COVID beans that I bought in March that we have not worked through. He says, this message, the things that I want to give you, physical and spiritual, come to me daily. I have them for you daily. You don't need to buy in bulk. (laughs) What are you doing showing up once a week? They're daily for you. I have given you a word. 
Are you in it? Are you seeking it? Are you growing in it with others? I have given you a word. Have you received it? And I love the letter my grandma wrote me. I poured over every word and looked at the meaning of each. What a message of love. You have been given a word, a message of what God has to say about you and what he thinks about you and who God is and what he's calling you to be. Here at the church, we're doing a reading challenge together. We're reading the Gospel of Matthew right now and some of the Psalms. There's a reading guide. Uh, they're out there on the tables and on all of our social media, our app as well. I want to encourage you to use this. You've been given a word. This week, the reading is Matthew 9 and 10 and some of the Psalms. It's not a lot. Dive in. You've been given a word. I want to look at some other things that emerge from this prayer. In John 17, uh, we're going to jump down to verse 12. It says this. Jesus said, while I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them. Not one of them was lost except for the one destined to be lost, that is Judas who betrayed him, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the, wor in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I don't belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask that you protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them, make them holy in the truth. Your word is the truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And then verse 20, I ask not only on behalf of these, that is those right around him, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that we all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Lots going on in this passage, but we see another thing that God gave Jesus, and that's a name. All right, so we've been given a word and a message, and now we see that God has given away his name. He has given an identity. He has given this to Jesus, and he says, I have protected them in your name, and now I'm going. So protect them, right? Give them your name. Names have all kinds of power. People ask me to write like references all the time. I work with college students. I get asked to write references all the time and to places that I know really well. And y'all want me to put my name next to your name? I, I care about my name, so be careful. Names have power. One of my favorite songs is by the Avit Brothers. It's called Murder in the City. I know it sounds like super happy and fun, Murder in the City. But it's a song that's written, he's thinking about a message as he's about to head into a dangerous situation. And here's how uh, one of the verses go. If I get murdered in the city, go read a letter in my desk. Don't bother with all my belongings, but pay attention to the list. Make sure my daughter knows I love her. Make sure her mother knows the same. And always remember, there's nothing worth sharing like the love that lets us share our name. And there is value in sharing a name with somebody. And there is connection in sharing a name with somebody. My grandma signed the letter, and I know that we have the same name. God has given us his name, his credibility. It is a commitment. It is a you are with me ness. It is a jointedness. And when we follow God, we are given his name. And so I don't know what people have called you or what identity you've been carrying or wrestling with, but he has given you his name. Okay, so we've been given a word, we've been given a name. And at the beginning, we said that Jesus was given also a people. I want to go back to that. John 17, 6 again, says, I made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. 
And then uh, jumping down to verse 20, I ask not only on behalf of these close to me, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their world, that they may all be one as you, Father, in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The final thing I want us to notice that Jesus has been given is that Jesus has been given a people. A purpose. People to impact, to share with, to love. And then in verse 20, we see that that does not stop just with his closest disciples. But then he thinks about those who will be impacted by those disciples. So Jesus is given a people and then the disciples are given a people. And those people are given a people. You see how it works? And you are given a people. And I am given a people. A purpose. There is a researcher. She specializes in studying happiness. And after extensive work for about 10 years, she discovered that something that produced a, a ton of happiness in people was generosity. That people who are generous are happier people. In fact, she discovered that the amount of happiness that increases in someone's life when they are generous is the same amount of happiness that would increase if they doubled their income. That sounds like a lot of happiness. I can imagine it, right? So she was really proud of this research. She found it to be true across all economic standings, across uh, all kinds of countries and ages and everything, all demographics. This is true. There was a problem, though. She wrote about it in Science Magazine. She wrote about it in the New York Times. She trusted her research, and yet when she gave things away, she didn't feel any happier. So she thought there's either a problem with the research or a problem with me. Shortly after she wrote about it in the Times, she went to meet with her accountant. It was tax time, and she was doing her taxes. She met, went to meet her accountant, and her accountant said, Hey, I read your article in the Times. And then he tapped the contribution line on her taxes. Have you? <laughs> he said, It sure doesn't look <laughs> like you have read your own research. And she realized that, that yeah, maybe generosity wasn't giving her any fulfillment because she wasn't really very generous. So she wanted to change that. She discovered in her country there was a program where people could volunteer to partner with at least four other people and commit to cover the expenses for a year for a family that was displaced and moving into their community. So she ended up partnering with 24 other people and they went together to sponsor this family. They were refugees from Syria, five kids, a mom and a dad. The 24 of them, they all got together. They found a house for the people. They covered the costs. They found stuff that they needed, and so they got furniture. They, they filled the fridge with food. They showed up at the airport. Can you imagine, like, 20-plus people at the airport with signs of this family who's, like, never been in the States before? Like, ah, a little overwhelming. They welcome them. They take them on bicycle lessons, teach them English, takes the kids to ice cream. They invest their lives with this family. In fact, one of her own children asks her one time, who's the oldest kid in our family? And the kid he's thinking about is one of the, the kids that came from Syria. It's my people. She gave way more of her time and her money and her energy to this family than she ever would have given away otherwise. She was given a people, a purpose. God has given us a people. There's beautiful things happening in this passage. First, we see that people in general are a gift. Like, when God sees you and me, he sees a gift. Now, I know there are some of you in this room who are like, yeah, I've been saying it. I am a gift to the world. I know. <laughs> but God sees you as a gift. And then God wants to invite you to see the other people who he's giving to you to be your people. 
you know, I, I can get overwhelmed by, like, the problems in the world. They seem very big. <laughs> like, who am I? What can I do about it? It can be overwhelming. You can get paralyzed. Like, oh, how do I make a difference? <laughs> but then when I reflect that, man, God has given me this place. God has given me this people. I have a people. My wife and my daughter, for one. My church family. You're my people. The college kids that I get to work with every week and the leaders I invest in there. The places I shop. The people I encounter at the coffee shop I spend way too much time in. The neighbors around my home. God has given me a people purpose. I I maybe can't make a big impact across the globe, but I can impact these lives. I can have a purpose. For many of you, you are new to the first temple thing. Is God calling you to this people? To invest here? To figure out what it means to, to be a community, a family, mess and all, together is God giving you this people. And I really believe that as we've studied the scripture, what's emerging for me is that one of the greatest gifts God gives us is that by understanding his generosity towards us, we then can turn and be the kind of people he's made us to be who join him in generosity mission and in character. The the researcher found that generosity impacts our happiness. Jesus would say that they would have their joy be made complete. Sounds about the same to me. Now we can celebrate the financial things that God has done at First Temple and we should. We should celebrate the words (laughs) The message that God has given each of us, access to God, repentance and forgiveness, the gospel message of new life available for you and me. We can celebrate the name, the name that we have been given by God, and we must celebrate the people that God has given us. We are invited to give as greatly as we can from what we have been given. It's who we're made to be. It's who we're called to be. To those who may feel like they have no hope or future or answer, God has given you a word. Those who feel like they have no value, no status, no credibility, God has given you a name. Those who feel like they have no purpose, no connection, God has given you a people. I will tell you, since about January, we have seen an interesting trend here at First Temple. This influx of families, young families, folks who have never set their foot in the door here before. Before COVID, we regularly had lots of people coming. It seems like in the last month, it's been like a lot. (laughs) What might God be saying to us? How might we welcome these people. Perhaps you're one of those folks who are new to it. How might God be calling you to be a part of these people? How might we together be each other's people and imagine the other people we can impact out there? Man, it is true that all of us are valued in our gifts for the Son, but we are also gifts for each other. What if we saw each other and new people and people out there the way Jesus sees them? How can we be gifts to them as well? I want to close spending some time reflecting on these things that God has given. So we're going to respond together in prayer about the things God has given. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I just want you to ask those questions to God in prayer and reflect and see what God may be saying to you. So let's pray together. In this moment, as you think about the generosity of God, what word, what words are God giving you? Ask God that question and listen. What word is God giving you?
Maybe it's a next step or an encouragement or a reminder. Maybe it's an affirmation. What word is God giving you? Now I want you to ask the Lord, what name has God given you? You know, we've talked a lot about how we see God in this series, but when God sees you, what does God see? What name has God given you? Child, beloved, son, daughter, what name has God given you? Here's the last question. What people has God given you? What people is God calling you to invest in and to love and to share his good news with? To pour yourself out in generosity toward? To connect with? What people has God given you? Lord, we thank you for your generosity towards us, that you would give of yourself, your message, your words, your name, your everything for us, that you have made us your people. God, may we respond to that. Maybe today some of us in this place have never responded that, never said yes to receive the gifts that you want to give us, your life and life eternal, your hope, your promise, your forgiveness. May we respond by the power of your Spirit. And those of us who have been made your people, may you challenge us and push us to identify what people you are calling us to. Lord, may you work and may you transform. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.